Okay, great. I'm just going to get started. So, good afternoon. My name is Elspeth, and I'm part of the Alliance Secretariat uh, team working on advocacy and partnerships. Um, this is our final plenary session of the day. Can we do more with less? How to continue serving children in need of humanitarian assistance in the face of a growing gap between needs and resources. I've, see, I've received quite a bit of feedback on the title of the session. Um, some people really dislike, can we do more with less? And the advocacy session earlier said we should be asking, um, how can we do more with more? Um, and somebody else told me it sounds like a supermarket advertisement. So I just wanted to share that feedback. Um, but anyway, um, jokes aside, as we have heard in various sessions throughout the last couple of days, this is a really critical topic. Um, and we are delighted to be joined today by representatives from the European Union Directorate General for European Civil Protection and Humanitarian Aid Operations, ECHO, um, the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration of the US State Department, and USAID's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance, and Hani will introduce our panelists shortly. To provide a very short framing for this session, funding gaps are not new. Whether we like it or not, and as humanitarians, I can pretty much say we do not like it, um, we live in a world where humanitarian needs are seriously outpacing the capacity and resources to respond. Today, more than ever, the humanitarian system is really struggling to meet the need, growing need for child protection in escalating conflict and crisis. Funding shortfalls are leaving humanitarian practitioners, child protection practitioners, your, yourselves, your teams, the frontline workers, unable to respond to the needs of vulnerable populations. Many of you joined the advocacy working group session earlier where we presented the emerging findings from this year's unprotected report, our annual child protection and humanitarian action funding analysis. As we know, the child protection and humanitarian sector has a history of being chronically and disproportionately underfunded. And the ability of the child protection sector to implement quality child protection, response and prevention programming is severely hampered. So we want to have this conversation here with you today. Now, moving to the next slide, I don't have the clicker. Do you have the clicker? Okay, just the objective of this session is really to provide space for a two-way dialogue, okay? Um, we really want to have a dialogue between child protection practitioners and some of our donor representatives here today to reflect on the current situation and have an opportunity to share our worries but also our hopes because we know that optimism always shines through the child protection and humanitarian action sector. We want to hear from donors on how we as a child protection and humanitarian action community can support donors in their efforts to ensure child protection is prioritized within their own agencies but also more broadly in their spheres of influence. And we also want to have the opportunity to hear from you so we can share with donors our concerns, our perspectives and our ideas. Where do we see the biggest impact and what crucial and sometimes less visible uh, elements of our work do we need to be safeguarded from funding cuts or funding reductions? So we're going to now hear from donors. Hani will moderate a panel. Then we're going to hear from you. We'll have discussions at tables. And if we have time, we'll have a quick report back. But fear not, we will make sure that the facilitators at the tables capture your key points because these are crucial to our advocacy efforts moving forward. So handing over to Hani. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and welcome again to our, our panelists. Uh, interestingly, there's always, uh, whether we like it or not, there's a bit of an invisible line between practitioners and donors. But what I want to say is that if anyone is on that side of the line with all of you guys are these guys because they're fighting internally to make sure that there's more funding for child protection. So these are our allies. <laughs> so let's be clear that they're our allies and not the other. So we have Beth Drev Drevlo, Humanitarian Protection Advisor from USAID Bureau, Bureau of Humanitarian Affairs or BHA as you all know, Beth. Then we have Haley Sands, um, Foreign Affairs Officer, uh, Bureau of Population, Ref uh, Refugees, and Migration of the US State Department, so PRM. A lot of you know that as PRM, Haley. Uh, and Maria Vargas Sim Simoyoki, is that correct? Great. Uh, protection, Gender, and Education in Emergencies Expert at ECHO. So welcome to all of you. Um, 
I'm going to pose a few questions to you guys and we'll try to do it on a kind of rapid succession of questions so that we leave enough time for reflections from, from the group as well. So the first question, um, I can just start from Maria from that side and come, come this way. Um, Maria, can you provide an overview of the humanitarian funding trends in your agency uh, and the prioritization of child protection within it? Yes, thanks, honey. Um, I s actually sat here because I thought I would be last, but oh. that has backfired. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> so, never mind. Um, so, within ECHO, we have actually had quite a steady financing in terms of humanitarian aid over the last few years. Um, despite the increase in crisis, we have had support from the European Parliament up to now in terms of funding. Um, I can say that we have increased our general protection funding um, since in 2019 we had 8% of our global funding was going to protection. In 2023-2024 that's 15% uh, that is going to protection. Um, out of which, and I think I'm, I'm going to kind of throw a lot of figures at you, I think this is just so you get an idea, but out of that uh, Latin America has the highest percentage. Latin America, out of the, the budget for Latin America, which is, I think this year was about 125 million, 34% goes to protection. Um, now, you will wonder, why am I saying protection and not child protection? We have certain issues in terms of uh, tracking our funding and tracking particularly child protection funding. Um, so when we get back to you and say you have to use an indicator is so that then we can track it <laughs> and tell you how much funding is going to child protection activities. But we do have some averages. So basically on average over the last five years, 32% of our funding for protection has gone to child protection. So that's about one third of our protection funding has gone to child protection. Um, it was higher uh, during COVID which I think is something worth reflecting on. What, was, what were we doing over COVID? That was because at that point, our child protection funding was half of our protection funding globally. Um, and then this year, for, sorry, for last year, for 2023, 24% uh, of our, sorry, 24% of the protection funding went to child protection. So we've gone a little bit down actually from that uh, kind of 30% that we were managing over the last five years. So we are seeing, we, we kind of see a fluctuation, but let's say in the last year we have seen like a, not 10%, but 7% decrease in terms of funding towards child protection. Yep. Great. Thank you very much. I'll just to keep the surprise going, I'll go to Beth next. Oh, wow. Okay. I was ready to go. Um, okay. From BHA side, the awesome news is we also have been increasing in protection funding. Um, Yes, <laughs> I really wanted to clap for your 34, 35%. Um, we chatted about that earlier. That's really impressive. Um, why have we increased? It's a lot of advocacy <laughs> because funding in general or in BHA has decreased, but funding for protection continues to increase year after year. Um, is it keeping up with that 40%? A uh, statistic that was cited, uh, I believe it was yesterday, then the last uh, two years, we've seen a 40% increase in conflicts. No, it's definitely not keeping up with that. Um, so there's still a battle to be won um, and a fight to be fought here. And I'm so intrigued at all the perspectives on the title. I'll just say, um, I look at that title and say, it looks like being smarter with what we have. Um, and I think we've got a long ways to go to continue to walk the talk that we are talking. Um, in terms of trends, I can say nothing um, as to what we expect because Congress determines what's coming each year and that is out of our hands um, and there are so many variables we can't even hypothesize. Um, but I will just therefore take a moment to share what is BHA looking for in child protection. Um, and we actually had this discussion earlier today, but when you're coming to BHA, you're fighting for a piece of the pie and you're fighting against other sectors. So integrated programming is a win on so many levels, but if you can demonstrate why or how your child protection activities are mutually beneficial 
for other sectors, you may gain a little bit of support even further as we also make the argument internally, why should we get more of the pie than another sector? So integrated programming is always a win. Um, also, it was said very well. I think we're just going to repeat so many things that have already been said. I'm keeping note and I'm going to try to change Repeat. Okay. <laughs> we yeah, the two of us, them, so. we're trying to not say the same thing exactly, <laughs> but we will echo each other. Investing in people is so key, and um, I love all the localization champions in the room. Um, but when we talk about investing in people, I think as child protection actors, our win is that we are the best place to bring the child's voice. And if we can't do it, we should definitely not be expecting anyone else to do it. So I think on that one, perfect is the enemy of good is what has been on my mind lately. Let's just get in there and start and do what we know and what comes almost naturally to social workers. Um, and then last two uh, thoughts on that. While we are supporting a local response, we are also supporting the ongoing professionalization of the response. And we are never going to ask communities to take all of the risk and all of the response because we never want anyone to operate outside of their level of expertise. So we definitely need staffing to do that. Um, and then I have a final point, but I have not I don't want to read all my little notes in front of me. Um, yeah, as Hani said, this is a dialogue and we're absolutely here for your creative ideas. So we did say to ourselves, we want to keep it short on our side because we're very excited to hear from you. Thanks, Please, Beth. Yeah. I will try not to repeat. Um, can I just say it has, I started my career in child protection, but it's been about a decade since I got to spend my day to day dedicated to child protection work. And it is such an honor to be here. It's my first Alliance meeting and it's just incredible hearing the stories that I've heard so far. So thank you. It has been really wonderful these first two days. Um, I always feel a little arrogant on behalf of the US government delivering the line that I'm about to deliver, but um, we are the largest single humanitarian donor um, and we believe that we're a really powerful voice in centering children in humanitarian response. And we have, uh, as the US government, but as PRM, who I'm obviously here representing, we have made significant investments in the global child protection architecture. So in fiscal year 2023, and I will say, I'm very glad I didn't follow Maria because we do not have stats the way ECHO does. And that is definitely a challenge for us and a weakness of ours. Um, so I'm really glad I didn't follow her on those. Uh, she has more data to share later, I think. Um, but in fiscal year 2023, the total global US humanitarian assistance reached nearly 15 billion. Um, including funding, of course, PRM, BHA, um, and we're really proud to support our international and NGO partners um, to address the really unique needs of children in humanitarian crises. Um, so we will, I just in, with regard to our overview of our assistance, we will continue to promote and support essentially core child protection services and emergencies. So we've talked a lot about all of these things, quality case management, caregiver support, community-based protection activities, so that they're included in a minimum service package in all emergencies and in all protracted crises. Um, we particularly support community-based programming, integrating programming across humanitarian sectors, obviously system strengthening, this is none of this is new to you. Um, just to talk a little bit about the trends that we're seeing um, fully, of course, <laughs> agree with Beth that there's a lot of, especially in an election year in the US, there's a lot of um, there's a big question mark about the way things are going to go. I think we're all following that. Um, but we're incredibly proud to support the Alliance this year. We um, obviously think the Alliance is incredibly important to global child protection work. Um, and we also provide, so I should say PRM also provides dedicated child protection funding. Um, UNHCR is uh, our biggest partner. So we give dedicated funding to its child protection unit. Um, and we believe that that pays dividends on a global level. So we're really, really proud to partner with UNHCR and the work that they're doing. Um, this year we were incredibly, so I joined PRM, just to give you a little context, I joined PRM five months ago. And I'm not new to the State Department, I've been there a decade, but new to PRM. Um, and I followed their work for a long time. And when I joined this year, there were a lot of really 
my first three months were super depressing because all the conversation we were having was about how we're going to have a really significant crippling um, cut in our funding. And I listened to my partners. A lot of you know Kelly um, Lauer, who is my predecessor. Um, we love Kelly. I wish she was here to join us. But um, I saw her face in meetings when we were discussing the way that this funding was going to go and the conversations we were going to have with partners. Um, and this is someone who's worked over a decade in this space and, you know, many of you know, and is incredibly dedicated to advocating for child protection work within the U.S. government, within PRM, in the State Department. Um, and thankfully, we received supplemental funding this year. So we were looking at a really catastrophic budget cut. Um, but what we know is that although, so essentially in May, uh, Blinken announced 578 million in additional funding, and of that, nearly 459 million um, essentially were res responding to the needs of refugees, vulnerable migrants, and other displaced persons across the Western Hemisphere. Um, and 376 million of that went to PRM. So we were looking at a shortfall of at least that much um, year to year. And what we know is that that's not going to happen every year. So we understand that although we got lucky this year, we could have a whole different conversation about what that means. But with regard to funding, we got really lucky that we could meet um, more needs and that we could provide more to our partners to respond to those needs than we were expecting. But we know that that's not going to be the case every year. Um, and so I think Hani, we started by saying not everyone loves, or I think, sorry, Elspeth, I think you were saying not everyone loves this question. And I think for us, it's not about doing more with less. It's about whatever we can fund. It's quality over quantity. It's ensuring that there is no duplication of efforts, that the coordination is so strong that we know that whatever the funding we have, and there will be, there, it will always, the needs will always eclipse the funding ability, right? And so um, it's really about how do we, do more, sorry, how do we ensure that it's quality over quantity? So I think I'll, I'll leave it there for that one. Fantastic, thank you so much. Since you have the, the microphone, keep it hairy. Oh, okay. Maybe you'll, you'll, you may do the next one? You do the next one. This so we, are, like, you're really we want us you on to, <laughs> you, I, we <laughs> want you to talk to us about what this group here yeah. and their colleagues yes. can do to help you as an advocate within a donor agency. Yeah to be able to advocate better for, for funding for child protection? Yeah, so for us, um, making the case for investment is about showing us what works. So um, as Hani said, like we are advocating every single day. We're fighting the political battles internally. Um, that is not to garner sympathy of any kind, just to say that like we are <laughs> right with you in the trenches just in a different way. And so it's about presenting the facts. So essentially the advocacy should not be like we know the the fact that you cannot do more with less, frankly. Um, I don't, I, that's why I think we all hate that question. Um, but essentially showing us that you are meeting all of the needs that you possibly can with the funding that you've had thus far um, by essentially being compelling and providing examples of how you've met XYZ needs with the money that you've had. So we're looking for tangible examples of how the resources that you have are transforming children's lives and improving their well-being because creating that human connection, that ability to not just show the numbers, but to really contextualize them, um, that's the case for investment for us. That's really what allows us to go and say, here's this individual case from here or there. Um, and we're hoping that you can essentially demonstrate that there are so many needs and we know how to fix it and this is why. And so that that contextualization is really, really important for us so that we, when we go and have those conversations, we can actually catch the attention of, of leaders and decision makers that we're trying to persuade. Great, thank you. I'll come to you, Beth, next. But just before I do that, I wanna recognize and acknowledge that the reason we are here is thanks to PRM, but mostly. There are a couple of other a couple of other donors who have also supported this, but it's primarily coming from PRM. Thank you very much for that. Beth. Okay. Um, on the BHA side, you will rarely, rarely see a funding, uh, a call for proposals from us. So you just have to come to us. Just pick up the phone, uh, find us in a meeting, um, send an email, come to us with your great idea. 
um, funding decisions are made at the country level. So when I say us, I mean, go to the country, please. Um, so in your various countries, um, make a relationship with the BHA teams. Don't wait for a solicitation because most likely it's not coming. Um, in terms of how are how is protection prioritized at the country level? HRPs. <laughs> so please get involved with your CPAOR in the HRP and the HNO. Do your very best to submit whatever information you can to help make the case for child protection at the country level. Um, we look at all of this data at the country level and say, okay, reasons to fund protection again this year. Um, also, we've already talked about um, presenting the case. Um, the data tells a story. Um, it's fantastic to see a greater and greater realization that if we're doing something, we must measure the result or the impact to the best of our ability. Of course, we know we can't do that perfectly. But any way that you can speak to um, what impact you are having, um, why you are best placed to do what you do, that what you are doing is actually addressing the issue. Um, and then to express the value add that you have. And this is a funny thing to say. Um, in the sense of we're pushing localization, we're pushing that communities should be playing to their strengths. We want to come and support them to do what they do best. But at the same time, we're saying that child protection is a profession and it is um, specialized and it requires skills that not just anyone has. So you have to find that really sweet balance. Um, and I guess where that comes in for us is where you speak to that we are doing things in a standardized manner, we have lessons learned, we, we carry out these approaches in the community because we know it works. We do it in a methodical way, we use evidence base, et cetera, et cetera. You know the lingo better than I, probably I haven't had to write a proposal in a couple of years. Um, of course, advocacy um, and any communication comes best in simple language. So other than those few key words that um, we know we want to see, if you just just speak straight um, to us what the need is and how you're going to address it. Um, and then finally, of course, what we've said over and over is we really want to see the participation of beneficiaries in um, expressing their need, in telling their story, in, in saying what works for them. Fantastic. Well, have I passed the microphone? Um, it's great that Ron is here. So all of you guys working with, with the CPAORs in the country to get, get it into the HRPs first, as a first kind of stop. Then the work of the donors start in making the case internally. Yeah, thanks, honey. Um, and I think I'll repeat a bit of what uh, the colleagues had said as well. I think one of the important things is you need to develop a reflex to talk to your donors. Um, and I think this is particularly important with also what you were saying before in terms of the fact that, that the three of us here are your allies, but I can't do anything if you show up two weeks before the deadline of a funding proposal and start presenting a whole system that you want to do then. This means we talk regularly, you present ideas, and you view it also as a partnership. And I really will stress this, and I know all of our partners hate this <laughs> when they're like, Echo wants partnerships, but we do not just want to fund things. But I think the, the relationship in regards to, to our funding strategies also develops over time with these partnerships, with us helping you with advocacy, with all those different with with the contact and 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 there i have to be quite honest honest i mean it has to be really a regular contact um, i'm sure the country colleagues will be uh, will be saying the same so the country colleagues in eco offices across the world have similar feedback you need to develop a relationship that is kind of goes beyond just the funding moments which is the hip as you may know so so beyond the hip you also need to be talking to the colleagues so that they are aware that there are these needs uh, you know present at the time i think the other thing that uh, beth and Haley were mentioning briefly is the fact that you have to be clear concise and actionable um so so it, we need to we need to have very very it's it's um 
to, to help me do my job, let's say, with the country offices that might not always understand child protection, I need to understand exactly what it is that you want me to do, <laughs> you know? Like, because sometimes it's a funding thing, sometimes it's an advocacy thing, but if it's not clear for me, then I, I and I get a list of 20 priorities, I'm not going to, I mean, I will choose what I think is best and just go with it, but that might not be what you really need. So, so it needs to be very, very, and concise also because we can't, I can't push everything, right, <laughs> with, the, with the colleagues in the country offices. And then the third point, which I think is important, and, and we talked about it when we were preparing the session with Elspeth, and I was bringing examples from the Middle East where I used to work, and it's the, the fact of using regional forums. So you have a regional forum here that benefits from the fact that it's a united one. So you don't have the division uh, as the other coordination mechanisms have between the REDLAC and the R4V. You have one, for example, in Latin America. But how does that forum advocate with donors uh, for specific child protection needs? Like, do you want to do joint donor briefings, for example, at certain points in the year on child protection? Uh, we, could, we had this discussion when we were talking about it. GBV has a lot of other things beyond, you know, they have the call to action, they have other instances in which they bring donors together to have these discussions. And we, we kind of, we have the CPAOR, we have the alliance, but I think that regional part is the one where we're not seeing because we do have these regional forums. I mean, in East Africa is the same, West Africa is the same, Middle East is the same. I'm thinking about like the one in the Middle East that was, I mean, amazing advocacy efforts, the no loss generation. They did amazing work with donors. I mean, that was their primary <laughs> objective. And I think they pushed the agenda on child protection quite a lot. Um, so I'm definitely saying like use your, the regional forums, think of how you can approach donors as a regional forum, because also it will be much easier for us to push things if it comes from a united voice. If it's not one partner that is coming and telling us that there are issues with children in, I don't know, Guatemala, but that as a, as a regional instance, you are able to prioritize the two, three things that are particularly important and, and the message continues to come across. So again, the regular, 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 because eventually I, I think I mean, I can push it, but then my country colleagues will also hear it, and then they'll hear it again from me, and then they'll hear it again from you, and then we also need to build <laughs> a little bit that uh, that momentum to be able to push for, for child protection. Thank you, Maria. Um, so you spoke to the partnerships, and I'll stay with you in, for a minute. Um, can you also tell us a bit what advice you may have for the community in terms of other types of partnerships just out not just echo specifically but outside of outside of that so i was this one is a difficult one because i think for all of us or, or particularly the ones i know echo is very humanitarian and we're a humanitarian <laughs> donor right and that's our sphere um so it's always difficult to think beyond and i don't want to to, to kind of sell you the, oh, we all must do Nexus because we know how difficult the Nexus is and we all try to do the Nexus. Um, so I was recently in the Cartagena Plus 40 uh, consultations. Uh, as you know, it's a kind of regional process that is ongoing. And what I thought interesting that I would kind of bring to this forum is the fact that they, there is a much closer relationship with the development banks. So the presentations on context and the presentations on a lot of the issues were done by the World Bank and the Inter-American Bank. And we're talking about banks that have people, I mean, technical people that are specialized in different sectors. I think if you look at the education sector, they have a much stronger connection with the banks, for example. They have a much stronger connection, I mean, the ECW, of course, but then there's the GPE, the Global Partnership for Education. And, and I think we need to start talking to them because particularly the systems work that we want to do and that the colleague was talking about, for example, earlier in Mexico, you're not gonna get very far with one year funding from ECO, right? That's, that's not gonna support the development of caseworkers and social workers and curricula and all that training that is needed. It's, I mean, in all the different countries, but that's where the longer term funding from particular instruments that the banks might have could help. So I think that's something worth considering and investing. Perhaps it's something where the CPAOR and the Alliance can think, join heads and think how best to approach this. The other one that I was, that I was thinking about in terms of interesting partnerships is private, the private sector. So I know that 
a lot of agencies have private sector connections for like donations um, or or the corporate social responsibility, right? I, I I think I was in Peru recently where there was a container full of Uniqlo clothing donated. <laughs> so so that kind of stuff is there, and that's great. But I think what we also need to consider is that private sector also has different forums they engage with with governments. Um, and I think what 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 was interesting for me to realize at this at this event I was at recently was that the private sector was doing a lot in terms of trying to get refugee inclusion in certain countries. Um, they were the ones talking about documentation and financial access and things like that. Obviously, it benefits them. They need staff that have documents that can open a bank account. So if we can think of ways in which the private sector could also advocate for particular children's issues, they have different forums to, they access different forums that we don't and that as a humanitarians we are never going to access they have different relationships in different ways so i think that's another one it's for brainstorming i i can't give you a solution on how it would work i was just very impressed i was like oh my god but um but definitely something that i think is worth exploring also to complement the the kind of landscape that we have right now in terms of partnerships that's great advice thank you very much um Haley. Yeah. So, <laughs> just, no, no, it will take a while. <laughs> um, so, we have discussed in previous sessions and also just a little bit uh, in the opening, Elspeth, the fact that needs are increasing. Yes. Funding is just not keeping up. Even if it's, it might still be increasing, it's not keeping up with the needs. Um, so, are you seeing any changes in the approaches to protect children as a result of this? Thanks for that question. Um, I did a lot of consultations with colleagues who have been working on this much longer than myself. And the answer that I kept getting was, there is no perfect answer to this. Otherwise, we would all be doing it. And I think that's fair. Um, there are two things that I'll point out, which we've talked a lot about the last two days. And one is, we need more multi-sectoral funding. Um, one thing that I heard over and over again was obviously that it's harder to have 10 projects, you know, one GBB, one nutrition, et cetera, et cetera, sector specific. Um, and we need to essentially just mainstream child protection into all of it. So that's something that we are seeing the applications that we receive, like we're seeing partners understand that, push that message um, and advocate for that. And therefore we're advocating for that internally. Um, and, you know, yesterday something was said where essentially they were talking about how we've had a dialogue on this for the last two decades, I should say, child protection practitioners have. And I think donors have maybe finally caught on that this is really the future, this is where we need to go, and this is also how we leverage every last penny that we have as we have this divergence, right, or this continuing um, difference between needs and, and funding. So that's that's one piece. So multi-sectoral funding and continuing to um, ensure that we leverage that approach to not only have a more inclusive response, but also to make sure that we're not, um, we're making the most of every dollar that we have or whatever the currency may be. Um, and then another thing that we've talked a lot about again over the last two days is localization, right? And so for us, it's incredibly important. Children, caregivers, and local communities know best. So I think I can safely speak for BHA that PRM and BHA, we obviously advocate very strongly for localization, for community-based programming um, through strengthening community-based child protection efforts and positive parenting programs, promoting youth leadership and participation. Um, in order to strengthen programming led and informed by communities. So this for us is something that um, when we see this, we obviously feel very aligned with that approach. We um, essentially meaningful participation, accountability, accountability, sorry, to affected populations and engagement with all members of the community um, is the way forward from our, our point of view. Um, so essentially, we need to figure out what those local strategies are, right? And focus on what's organically grown. So that's why we think obviously the Alliance is incredible um, and so important because it brings together local voices um, and we can strengthen capacity. And you know, um, 
I made a note that Marina said something earlier in the session, collective, I, I'm not going to get this right, but this was the gist of it, which was our collective voice is stronger than an individual voice. And I think that's, that's essentially the theme here. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Beth, the same question to you. Thank you. Um, so my hope for everyone is that you will be given the choice if there is a budget cut as to which direction you want to go, but very much realize that sometimes you're not given the choice. Sometimes the donor tells you where they want the cuts, but hopefully you're given the choice. Um, and if you're given the choice, um, a few places um, I'm, to be very, very strategic. And here's just a few things we've seen some of our partners do um, from the very beginning plan to leave. So from day one, be communicating to communities that this is X amount of time and we are setting up an exit strategy today and we are here for you to tell us what's going to work as we pull out. Um, you may not leave, you may be there for five years, but to start from day one with the plan to leave. Um, second, again, what we've all been repeating, focus on what works um, and have definitely seen partners when really pressed have to pick from their menu of options, which is never something we want to do, but really have to consider what action is having impact. And is there an action amongst our menu that could have the impact that other actions might have? So if you have a safe space, you have PSS, you have case management, and you need to trim, how can you get the same result or as close to the same result with maybe two of those three activities. So it just takes a lot of careful consideration and really, again, measuring and looking at impact. Um, more strategic targeting, of course. Um, and this is picking amongst the vulnerable who are the more vulnerable. Crazy to think, but again, if we're trying to get in here and do life-saving, um, what can we, what does the humanitarian space absolutely need to work on in terms of life saving and what can be handed to development actors. And again, that is the cliff that we all fall off and we don't often get to connect, but we keep hoping for it. Um, and sometimes it does exist. Um, and that's where I would say system strengthening efforts. I see more and more partners very aware that this is part of our exit strategy and this is part of budgets being cut. We've got to lean in on not just the local side in terms of CSOs and community, but also government systems. Um, and then when it comes to localization, I know that we talk about it in so many different, from so many different perspectives, but I always hope that we never choose to drive localization simply because it's more cost effective. But what's been discussed in the room is that we are looking at what are your strengths in the community and what are your gaps and where can we fit in. And that takes more time and time is money. <laughs> and this is what I will say for BHA on the final point is we do recognize that uh, we do need more time to do better work and protection particularly is one sector that requires more time to get up and running and to finish out cases, etc. So when you approach BHA, ask for the time. And if they say no, ask for, is there any leeway? And, and do they simply need a justification? Um, but where we can, we are trying to lean towards more time. Fantastic. Thank you very much, all three of you. We are still going to continue this session, but the panel part of it is finished. I'll just mention a couple of points that I feel like were kept coming up and I think are the core of the message that we are hearing. Um, one is look at the donors as your allies and build partnerships and maintain a dialogue, right? I think we heard it from all of you guys. Um, also look outside of the usual suspects in terms of funding. Maybe, maybe there are areas where we, we need to complement the type of funding that BHAs, PRMs and, and echoes of the world can give you. Um, so really kind of thinking about uh, expanding that horizon for ourselves. Uh, systems and localization both came up um, over and over, and I think all of us are in line with that, but I think the articulation of it and then 
giving it to you as tools for you to also sell it upwards is, uh, is important. Documenting impact and showing the donors where the impact is, um, is, is critical. And I want to close this part of the this, this session by saying that it is um, important to notice and, and recognize that funding for child protection proportionally has increased. So we are doing something right collectively with you guys. So it's not like everything is, is negative, but we should recognize that there is some positive in it, in it happening already. But let's continue that and hopefully we'll see parity in terms of how child protection is funded with the rest of the humanitarian sectors. Thank you very much. I'll hand back over to you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you ever so much. So I'm changing the title of the session and I think we're going to go to what do we need to do collectively to ensure resources are allocated in ways that have the biggest impact for children and their protection. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, so and now we're going to move into some group work. So, um, la próxima por Okay, perfect. So at your tables, uh, you have two questions. Um, oh, it's done. Okay. You have two questions. Um, there's four up here. So if you get through your two questions or you prefer the others, please feel free. But it was just to make sure we had responses to all of them. So here are your questions. It would be great just to have some discussions to, you know, talk about some of your hopes and your worries about funding um, in the context of crises. Um, maybe share with each other some of the actions that you might have to take internally within your organizations to prioritize uh, child protection. Um, we often receive requests or ideas through some of our Alliance members, and we thought it could be great to exchange some of these between us. Um, if you were faced with the impossible task of doing more with less, what would you prioritize? Thinking really about what has the biggest impact. And then finally, what would you like donors to consider when allocating resources for child protection? As I said earlier, what are those often invisible but absolutely fundamental elements of our work that we would like to safeguard at all costs? So we move now into our group work for about 20 minutes. We probably won't have time for comprehensive takeaways, but your facilitators will take some notes um, and we will capture all of your discussions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, time is up for this uh, group work. Um, and we have actually a few minutes. So um, we can take three groups just to provide a very quick uh, takeaway from their discussion, if anyone would like to. Any volunteers? Thanks. So we were answering question three and four. We didn't answer the question, but we discussed a lot. Um, we say that we don't like the question because it sort of erodes the quality when you start to do the impossible task. We centered so much on uh, localization and seeing how um, providing money or funding local organizations will reduce or can reduce costs. And preaching what, well, preaching, we didn't say preaching, but uh, uh, don't up donors pushing us to localization, but then um, policies and practices are not really enabling localization. We talked about how we would prioritize. It shouldn't be about us prioritizing, but uh, linked to what we've been discussing about accountability, thinking about community priorities, not our priorities, and that can help us prioritize. We talked about system strengthening as a way to do the impossible because it's more sustainable. And then we started talking about what is system strengthening. It has policy implications. It has human resource implications. It has legal system implications. So at what point do we start? And it's something longer term. We may not be able to do it in the shorter term. But the spirit is to work to, to prioritize system um, programs that have systemic changes. Should I continue or do you want me to pause? Last point. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about the dilemma of um, life saving versus uh, investing in longer term, prevention versus response, and finding a balance because uh, response is critical, but prevention is also more sustainable and critical for sustaining what we're doing in protection. Great. Um, sorry, I'm just going to squeeze a very last 30 second. 20. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, we talked about predictability. That is for question four. What should donors consider? We talked about if we had predictable funding and longer term partnerships. 
that would help us also in terms of planning and knowing what to expect and how to prioritize as well as adaptive ad adaptive programming and equity in donor policies. There's Fantastic. a lot packed in there. Thank you so much. I think there. the table. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so the table behind. It's OK if I speak in Spanish. Sí, sí, por favor. Teníamos dos preguntas. We had two questions, but because of issues of time, I'm going to focus on the second one. The, what should the donors consider when assigning resources for uh, child protection? We were talking about expanding the understanding of what human resources mean, especially because on the issues of child protection, it's not as simple to focus on other types of things, such as uh, materials, for example, but also in the importance of uh, human resources and child protection many times implies that uh, people are in those territories accompanying those processes and the population groups on a longer term and not the rapid response of delivering materials as but the uh, supportive nature of longer term working. We were talking about the uh, impact indicators, and we know the importance of these markers so that we can measure, but we uh, know that it is a challenge to have these impact markers because many times uh, we talk about proposals for HRB. We talk about how we can have markers for psycho psychological and psychosocial markers and how can we measure that. And many programs are focused on supporting mental health and psycho uh, social uh, support for girls, uh, boys, and adolescents. Finally, we would like to reiterate that uh, we understand that emergencies and processes of, uh, of complying with the times uh, when we're talking about child protection systems they include a lot of intersectionalities that have to deal with longer term because there's no way to respond to all needs that a boy, girl, or adolescent may have because of all the emergencies that may interconnect, especially in Latin America, plus all the uh, vulnerabilities that they may have because they belong to a specific population group and that these processes uh, should be uh, much more longer term. Thank you. Perfect. And I believe we have time for one more. One more, one more participation. Just so that we can uh, go away really happy and not repeat answers, we were between three and four. The group spoke about building capabilities at the state level, thinking about the government stakeholders and the answers so that there's greater impact in the communities, leaving uh, a footprint of transformation that would not depend on NGO financing, uh, but it could be more sustainable. Also in mobilization, we need to work with the state to decide how they can allocate funds for resource mobilization within their policies. And on the third question, we spoke about including the donors in the network for developing and designing strategies because I might be able to contribute something different and this way we can ensure that the strategies align with the demands of the reality and finally to think that within the context of response we have to uh, establish the prevention and mitigation processes because humanitarian actions may uh, consider display uh, may ensure that uh, population that is in displacement is taken into higher consideration than local uh, population. Perfect. Thank you so much. And then just to wrap up the session, um, we invite you to share one short key takeaway each um, from, from some of the feedback that we've heard. Thank you. So I apologize. I've only heard one of you because my little machine wasn't working. No, it's okay. I'll get it from notes from my colleague, I'm sure. Um, so I'm actually not gonna speak to it, um, but Yvonne, brilliant, all of it, loved it. Um, but I'm just sitting here realizing as I think about how is funding going up and Hani said it, it's your advocacy um, and it has so mattered and we are where we at because of 
good work in the field and speaking well about the good work. So um, where is the answer? It's right here. So there's a lot, a lot of hope. I also only heard the English responses, so I apologize. I wasn't, we weren't prepared for the, the little headphones, the little translator. Um, I wanted to maybe just comment on something Maria said, which is essentially communicate with your donor because we love to hear from all of you. And I think that relationship building is so important. And if we don't have answers and we aren't able to provide guidance, we can find people who can, right? So I sit on our policy team, for example, um, and our regional teams are experts in the countries that they cover. And so we can connect you with the right people and make sure that you're tapped in to all of the levels, or for us at least, the layers of each of our offices that we sit in. So I just want to reiterate, I think that's such a powerful point, just to know that we're here and to reach out so that we can respond to specific inquiries throughout the year, um, as you may have questions, and we can respond in a sort of more tailored, specific way to whatever you're experiencing or challenges you're facing. So don't be shy. Yo sí escuché todo, no se preocupen. Don't worry, I heard everything. <laughs> so I'll fill them in afterwards. <laughs> I can't answer all of them, unfortunately. Um, I think one of the ones that are, are definitely, I think it's important what the colleagues in the back were mentioning about the fact that child protection requires staff and that staff needs to be in a long term kind of approach and that also has to be there needs to be a predictability of funding because obviously you don't hire someone and train them up and then get you know like and then your funding goes away in three months. Um, so definitely, I think that's a very good point. Uh, believe me, it's a point I try to make to my colleagues as well. <laughs> so I would really appreciate it if you make it also. <laughs> so it comes from all sides. But definitely, I think that's that's a very important one. I think, look, we have, uh, you know that we have very particular, we're very particular donor and not, I mean, per, yeah, particular, let's leave it at that. Um, but <laughs> so we have the only projects that get 24 month funding that some of you might know is education projects. And why is that? Because there was an advocacy done for a very long time by education partners on the fact that you cannot fund education for only one year because of the transition of children from one year to the next, right, in school years or integration of children into systems. So I think we need a little bit of similar advocacy from the child protection partners on why we need to perhaps go to that 24 month uh, funding cycle. I don't think you're gonna get more than 24 months with ECHO, let's be realistic <laughs> also. But I think that would already be more helpful. Um, I'm happy to discuss later and, and you guys are welcome to contact me and it's something we can work on uh, together. I know it's also my colleague that also leads on child protection, Elsa. We've talked about this a lot. That's the first one. And then the second one I want to comment on is this issue of like impact indicators, difficulty in measuring certain things, um, all of that. I think that's where the alliance comes in. Um, you have so many people in the alliance that have so much experience in terms of like they know way more <laughs> than I do <laughs> in terms of all sorts of things and I think that it's important to reach out and to the different working groups that have been working on some of this so because they are the ones that have a that that can help you develop these systems I give you an example I mean we are changing our indicators. Sorry for whoever wants to apply for ECHO next year. This is the, this, it's coming for 2025. Uh, but our consultation process on our indicators was with the Alliance and the CPAOR because you guys are, especially those two are the ones that know how to measure impact, how to measure MHPSS, all of that. So please, I would urge you to use what is out there and, and benefit from the wealth of experience uh, that supports already the great initiative. And, oh, just very quickly, because I know everyone wants to go for drinks, anticipatory prevent, uh, action and prevention uh, that the colleague was mentioning, definitely important for us. We have it as a separate funding. Uh, you know very well we have the DP line, the disaster preparedness line. I think now the challenge will be how will you guys that do child protection be able to get in to that disaster preparedness sort of sphere. Because I, to be honest, like uh, we, we talked about this on Monday about climate change as well. There is a lot already out there. There's a lot of platforms. 
there's a lot work of work being done, especially on disaster preparedness, and we don't see the child angle in it. So definitely something worth pushing. Uh, again, happy to discuss further, but uh, I leave it out there that we and that's extra funding from the other one. Uh -huh. So there's even more funding on the disaster preparedness side that you could access potentially. So just leaving it out there. Great. Thank you very much, uh, all three of you. A really helpful discussions. And thanks, everyone else, for your feedback. And we'll capture everything that you have, you have mentioned.